It's a very interesting introduction. <laughs> <laughs> we will see what we can do with that. So here's a statement that I think could be useful start. We're in the middle of a revolution in science with the recent possibility to make large amounts of data widely available in combination with computing resources. This has happened over a couple of decades. I remember in 2018, we mirrored in Europe the um, Alan Rain mouse atlas of in situ hybridization data, 20 terabytes. And we had to ship the disks on an airplane to Europe, 20 terabytes. We probably would have found another way now, I think. So, this is a competitive and changing landscape for young researchers, not at least. And I'd like to comment on three different aspects that I think can be relevant for you. Um, one is the tools and data as drivers for science, being aware of having access to high quality analytical tools and data, which is most likely very important. And, Many young researchers will, of course, also be contributing to this. The other is the open science trend, aiming to remove barriers for sharing of any kind of output, resource, methods, tool at any stage of the research process. That is kind of a formal definition of open science. And the third is the repl replicability and reproducibility crisis, and we'll return to these two terms which is usually defined as an ongoing methodological crisis in which it has been found that the results of many scientific studies are difficult or impossible to replicate or reproduce. This has not at least been a message from um, some of the world's leading journals. And they are working very actively on dealing with it. Let's first take a look at tools and data as drivers for science. Usually we, or very often we think of ideas or paradigms as drivers of science, top-down ideas that comes from equations in some cases, various concepts, or bottom-up ideas that are based on experiments. But we often think that they are the drivers. In addition, of course, tools are drivers. For example, if you get a magnificent new data acquisition instrument that acquires data you've never been able to get before, that will drive your science. The same with powerful software, uh, processing of data that you can do will be a driver, uh, computing capacity very often. The data, the output from the instruments, the outputs from data processing are typically also seen as drivers for science. And in this landscape, the eBrains research infrastructure contributes with aspects related to tools, software, computing capacity, and with aspects related to the data. So it's relevant for this, this aspect. Uh, the software and the workflows that, that's made available, I think that was really wonderfully presented by Andrew Davison. They are developed for well-defined use cases. They are versioned, continuously updated, improved. They are typically accompanied by more documentation than what you find for most scientific software. They have a higher technology readiness level, TRL. That means that they are a bit more stable than what can often be the case. And they are typically embedded in analytical pipelines and prepared for use with data sets that you also can find through events. And there is possibility for some support for many of these tools. So that's a relevant comment related to to software and workflows. And for data and models, well, we, the data we, we have, or the data models and software we have so far in this um, so-called knowledge graph or map there, originates from 1,700 researchers. It's around 1,000 data sets. And uh, they are in machine-readable, human-readable metadata formats. They use a metadata standard. They are curated. They have control on access depending on the needs for the data set. They allow for comparison between modalities and species, and they link to what is unique for the brain, namely the atlases. We need three-dimensional atlases, just like in geography. 
you will typically connect data to locations on the planet. And we do as much as possible the same with the atlases. So moving on, next, the open science trend. Is there anything eBrands can do there? Because this is a strong trend, but let's look at the trend first. Is it something to bother about or should we just forget it? <clears throat> what is it? It's a research accelerator. I think I like that term. Um, or you could say it's about scientific knowledge of all kinds being openly shared as early as practical. Quite precise definition. And it can speak to all kinds of contents. In our context, we would emphasize the data that comes out of our instruments or measurement methods, the metadata we use to describe, the code, for example, for software, that's the most relevant ones, I think. And then there are requirements on when to do that, the conditions and the credit. So open science doesn't mean that everything is available for anyone at any point in time, but it means that it's organized properly so that you know what's going to be available, you know what the conditions are, and if you can get it, when, and so on. This is a strong and clear requirement and an EU funded project uh, will not, uh, will have to deliver on this, it's a requirement now. So they require open data, open science, uh, have introduced new metrics, uh, clear rewards. And the aims for open science policy under Horizon Europe, which is the current scheme, is to promote the adoption of open science practices, ensure that beneficiaries retain intellectual property rights, and require data to be fair and open by default, with some exceptions possible for commercial purposes. This again speaks to the fact that it has to be defined, not that everything is available, but it has to have, to have a position on it, and to engage and involve citizens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is very clear policies on open science. What I also think will be very important, potentially hugely important, is the change that's taking place in the United States. Because uh, the NIH introduced in 2003, the data sharing policy, which basically said that if you had received a grant of more than 500,000 US dollar, you would have to share your data. But at that time in 2003, you could in principle probably share the data in a shoebox. Now that has changed a little bit over the, those last 20 years. So there is now an NIH data sharing policy refresher coming on January 25 next year. And this is much tougher and much clearer and more well-defined than before, as you can see from these keywords on the screen. And uh, these originate from, uh, from Lyric Jorgensen at the Office of Science Policy and the NIH. And they also, in that refresher, introduce that costs for repository and staff time can be included in grants and are expected to be included in grants, grant proposals. Uh, it's a clear aim that this should accelerate the research enterprise, advance science, making previously unavailable data sets available, and so on. And it's about a culture change. And this is a key point. It is not an add-on. And that is maybe the biggest difference because usually sharing of data has been seen as something that, well, okay, let's do it um, because we have to, but that's an add-on. This is then a culture change. That's the intention. We'll see how fast it will go or, or to what extent they will really require it in practice. Uh, but at least it is a, clear direction and a change of the rules. This was followed up, for example, uh, last year with um, the National Academies workshop on changing the culture of data management and sharing. There will be reports on that coming out now soon, where the strategies and resources and promises in this area were discussed and many practical aspects uh, were also brought up a lot about the best practices for repositories, about the extent to which data value was anticipated and planned, 
and how this might inform prospective planning for sharing. So there's this very intense focus on access to data. The Society for Neuroscience also has had several actions in this area. For example, an online workshop on Beyond the Bench, the broader impact of rigorous research, which speaks directly to these uh, topics. <coughs> look at that if you're a member, and uh, it's, it's an online uh, workshop that's recorded. So eBrands, of course, is relevant for this because what eBrands does is to provide data and tools in an open context and thereby meeting the requirements from societies and funders for open science. And also in this way, eBrands connects uh, researchers and contributes to co-developments in the field of neuroscience research. Now let's look at the third one, the replicability and reproducibility crisis. This has been quite a topic uh, for discussion in, in, um, in leading journals. Reproducibility, that is arriving at the same finding based on the original data or tools used. Well, that means that if the data are not available or the tool is not available, you simply cannot reproduce the research. Replicability means arriving at the same finding based on new data, meaning that if I do what you said you did with the same methods or the same approaches that you explained in your paper, I will, of course, arrive at the same findings. But that doesn't happen. And that can be because the precision of reporting is not fine enough. For example, if there are details left out. Um, now, how good science is that? It actually means trust us. You don't need to be able to do this. We just know it, but that's it. And this is not good enough. The leading journals don't accept it anymore. They do what they can to avoid it. They push and push and push. NIH is changing their policies. So we are used to a business model where the journals and the articles are the target. And there's a clear reward mechanism. So that's the driver. Get the paper together, publish, get the credit for this, next, move on. That's a model that has worked for 300 years. Um, Peer review was invented in the last century, not 300 years ago. So that came in the 50s and something like that. And for some journals, even later. Technology that would allow the sharing and this type of reproducible, potentially reproducible research has been around for a while now, but not so many years. So we are in a changing world, but it takes time to adapt to changes. We maybe primarily work as if we were living 30 years ago. So th this can be dealt with, with what's called rigorous. That's the term used in this Society for Neuroscience Science Workshop. Rigorous or trustworthy research. That is applying the appropriate research tools to meet the stated objectives to buy to best practices in method selection, high quality research design, reporting of both data and interpretations to academic community. Data and interpretation. Interpretations has always been there. It's the data that's the critical point. As few uncontrolled factors as possible, state information that is assumed to be of relevance, and the last point, investing in making the data available. So let's take a look at that. Um, there's tons of literature on this. So it's, 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 this is becoming now a new industry. So if some of you are considering where to go as an early stage researcher, you can go in different directions. You can also go in this direction. It's a big field. 
here, here is just one example. You can go and find these things in tons of varieties of these opinions on why you why should you share, why should the researchers share their data? And here is an MIT libraries version, which I liked. Um, Increase your research impact, making your data available to other researchers, etc., can impact discovery and relevance of your research. Preserve your data, use the repository which takes care of the data, maintain integrity of the data, managing and documenting the data throughout its life cycle will allow you to better understand what's in the data and also for others. Meet grant requirements, that's what we just discussed, promote new discoveries. There can be new things coming out if others can build those data into new collections, for example, or apply some other analysis. Support open access, be a catalyst for research and discovery. So those are typical arguments, and there are many different arguments in favor of this along the lines so of what we see on this slide. So the way I see it, the importance of of, of access to data has something to do in, in the neuroscience context uh, with integration of data. For example, when we want to study something in the brain, we, we know that we have a huge challenge in going across all these levels. For example, the, the spatial scales or the temporal scales, it's, it's enormous. So you typically work at one level or one floor in the building, so to speak. But but to understand what's what's happening, you, you, you have to go up and down. So you have to combine information and integrate. And that's totally impossible if you're going to do that based on strings of text that describe something. You, you have to go to the data. So combining data from different sources into a single unified view is probably a reasonable definition of integration. And the most complex topics in neuroscience can only be studied by such integration. It's, Many people claim that they're, they're, they're working on understanding the brain, but be cautious when you hear such claims. What are they understanding? They're understanding one level far away, for example, from the neuron in some cases, or the other way around. So that is really very demanding. Answering specific research questions, performing hypothesis-driven research, that's one way of doing it which is absolutely essential. But you can also have data-driven research where the topics of the questions are coming out of the collections of data because you see something there and you start to ask because you are inspired by what you see in the collections. These are relevant aspects also, I think. Integration begins with access to interpretable and actionable data, something you can get, you can interpret, you can understand and then analyze, put together in a new way, acquiring knowledge. So, um, so I, I had a job as the head of institute for eight years, and there I had interviews with people who were applying for the leading positions as research group leaders. One of the surprises that a few people could or a few people could be taken by surprise with the question, so what are your experiences with teaching? Or well, they didn't have any thinking around that at all, which is the problem if you're going to an academic institution. The next question, which can be a problem in the future is, so what is your position on open science? Where are the data you have worked on in your papers? But that can be fixed. There's a classical publication list for a young researcher with four papers in journals. And in addition, this researcher has data that are published so that you actually can get the data and cite the data. And also you can put the collection inside the system and have a series of such data set citations. At the moment, these citations are difficult to track, admittedly. DUI scraping doesn't work that well. But they're fully possible to list, and it's fully possible to, through tracking of citations of the papers, you will also be able to see to what extent the data are cited. 
So this is a parameter which is likely to play a role in the near future. So in the, in the e-brands research infrastructure, what I recommend you to do if you are interested in looking at it is simply to browse the portal, look at the different software workflows, discover data computational models, look at the community as well, the community space, which is actually developed by the technology fund who's involved in organizing this meeting. Look at the news because that gives an idea about what's happening and create an events account at the bottom of the front page. So very, very fitter there is just apply for account, which you will get if you apply from your institutional email. If you apply as donaldduck at gmail.com, there will be more trouble. Community, that's where you find many of these things. This is the services on the left. But I also like to emphasize an environment for working together with researchers and also trying out many of the tools and services that is the collaboratory, which belongs under community. So the collaboratory is a, is a wiki where you will find different uh, opportunities for working with colleagues. You can invite all the colleagues with an events account into the collaboratory. You can store data there and you can take in different kinds of tools that are available in this environment. That is an example of the middle level here, an access controlled service that requires an events account. Many are, of the services are open, for example, to just search and find data that's open. Uh, whereas all the services requires a process where you have to apply. For example, if you want to have lots of computing uh, resources for a particular thing, you will have to apply for it, but you can also do that easily. So that's kind of the summary of my thoughts around uh, relevant comments to, to the talk. Thanks very much.